Tuesday, the last event of our series of America's Great Divides with Community Advocates, uh, we're going to be talking about the internal divides in the two political parties. Uh, we're also on election night on November 7th at Wallace Annenberg Hall uh, hosting an election watch so you can see what happened in New Jersey and Virginia. You may not care all that much about those two places except those of you who are from there except that what happens there is probably going to tell us a, bit, a lot about what's going to happen next year. Uh, I am going to introduce uh, our guest, Congresswoman Rosa Delora. It's I've known her 40 years uh, and we're friends, uh, but in a formal sense she is the Congresswoman for Connecticut's 3rd Congressional District. She serves in the Democratic leadership in the House. She's co-chair of the Steering and Policy Committee. She's the ranking member on Labor, Health, and Human Services and the Education Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, her book, which I loved, The Least Among Us, Waging the Battle for the Vulnerable, can be purchased here at the back, what's well, actually not the back table, it's the front table, uh, or you can get it on Amazon.com. Uh, she's going to speak for 10 minutes or so, then we'll have a conversation, and then I'll leave plenty of time for you folks to ask questions. Rosa. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, really delighted to be here. What a beautiful campus uh, you have and gorgeous weather. I'll uh, fly home red-eyed tonight back to Connecticut where it will be cold. Uh, so, uh, But it's lovely to be here. And I want to just say a very, very big thank you uh, to a dear friend, and uh, that's Bob Schrum, and thank him for his introduction. As he has said, we know each other uh, for almost 40 years. It goes back to when I served as Chief of Staff for Senator Chris Dodd uh, from Connecticut. And that was uh, even long before you and, and my husband, Stan Greenberg, teamed up to do some things uh, uh, together. So I knew you first, Bob. Uh, and uh, so, but, but Bob and his wife, Mary Louise, um, uh, and first, Mary Louise, or Otzi, is uh, a soul sister, and uh, in her own right, a force of nature. Um, and uh, so the four of us have been long time, long time friends. And that's both politically and personally. Uh, and our families are really intertwined, and we experience together historic change uh, in Israel uh, and in Britain and in other places. So I'm excited that Bob Schrum is here um, as a director of the Institute uh, because he has had a front row seat to history in elections both domestically uh, and abroad. And all of you here today, whether you know it or not, but I'm going to tell you, you really are very, very fortunate to have access um, uh, uh, to his uh, expertise. Um, and, uh, he's written more speeches and books for uh, political people and candidates all over the, the globe, um, and uh, has written one of his own books. Uh, but he has been a speechwriter, a political strategist uh, par excellence. And um, he has advised senators, presidents, and prime minister. And for me, he defines of politics and public policy. I love the center and what you do here. It connects academic work uh, to on the ground political experience, uh, motivating young people like yourself to become really active in the world of politics and realizing that politics can be such a force uh, for good. And more than ever now, we need uh, all of you uh, to, uh, to, to, to be engaged. So um, this, uh, this institute, it really is the gem of the West Coast. So I'm thankful for the in, uh, invitation to discuss my book, as Bob mentioned, The Least um, um, Among Us. And I might add just very quickly that my understanding, and I think it was Christy who mentioned this to me, that this becomes a very safe space for people to talk about politics and to debate uh, and uh, with, without having to pick a side, uh, if you will. And that really is so, so refreshing. Let me just tell you about the book that I have written. I told Bob that I am a, this is first and last time. It took me three years to write this book. Um, and uh, so, but I'm very excited about it. What's it, what's it about? It is, it is about the social safety net that exists in this nation. It's existed uh, for the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, and what I believe uh, and what I lay out in the book is uh, what the social safety net has meant in our, our, in our uh, country today, what's it meant to the lives of people, 
my view is that it is a reflection of the values of this nation. And it says that it's not every man or woman for himself or herself, but we have a responsibility, a social responsibility, a moral responsibility for others, and to be accountable for others, especially in difficult times and where there are challenges. I learned this in my own home, uh, around my kitchen table. Uh, my folks, after tough jobs, my mother a garment worker in the old sweatshops in New Haven, Connecticut, my dad an insurance salesman, and an uh, immigrant from Italy, uh, daughter of an Italian uh, immigrants who only could dare dream that their daughter would serve in the United States House of Representatives. But they served on the city council, both of them at different times. My mom is the longest serving member of the city council. She served there for 35 years. Uh, longest serving man or woman in the history of the New Haven Board of Alders. Uh, what they did, they didn't write omnibus legislation, they didn't write a crime bill, they didn't write a health bill, but what they did was they ministered to their community. They made government work for the people in their community, whether it was translating documents, uh, difficult with social security, getting a kid a job, those are the lessons that I learned and the lessons that I took with me um, uh, uh, to the House of Representatives. And when I got there, what I found was that they, these issues, about retirement security and uh, uh, helping people to put food on the table through nutrition programs and food stamps or child tax credits and income supports to help family pay their bills. These were not partisan issues. It was legislation that was crafted by Democrats and by Republicans uh, as, as, as well because the people who served believed that there was a need, there was a problem, there was uh, difficulty on uh, these issues in this country and from whatever approach you you uh, made toward it you had to achieve the goal of trying to do something about it uh, for the benefit of the people of this uh, of this nation that began to unravel with Newt Gingrich 1995 with the contract with America uh, from there we look at the attack on the social safety net uh, from the Tea Party and now this is my view uh, that we are experiencing the most massive assault on the social safety net uh, by President Trump and by Speaker uh, Paul Ryan. Uh, and the way I start the book, at the heart of the book, and if I can just read uh, for a second, it bears repeating that corporations do not feel free to poison us, sell us spoiled meat, lock our daughters up in ninth floor sweatshops with no fire escapes, employ our underage sons in coal mines, force us to work 13-hour shifts without overtime or a break, or call in private armies to fire rifles at those who dare strike for higher wages. It's not because corporations experienced a moment of zen and decided to evolve. No, they were forced into greater accountability and social concern by the legitimate actions of a democratic small-d government. In other words, if we depend on goodwill, we are all screwed. Growing up in New Haven, Connecticut, I saw ample evidence all around me of just how vulnerable hardworking people are in the face of corporate indifference. In 1957, when I was barely a teenager, the Franklin Street fire claimed the life of my friend's mother. Fifteen people died in that fire because they couldn't escape the smoke and the flames. A fire escape was locked and the ladder would not extend to the ground. There had been no fire drills and doors opened the wrong way, blocking exits. It was a disaster and it happened down the street from my house. It is impossible to be an eyewitness to events like that and not be touched by the gravity of our responsibility to one another. The sense of responsibility is very much rooted in my family, which is laid out in the book. I'm often asked by the press, Congresswoman Delora, what motivates you? What, what motivates you to take up the issues that you take up uh, and, and the votes that you take in the House of Representatives? Well, it's not the 26 years that I've spent in the House of Representatives, uh, which I am blessed to serve. I, 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 I love it. I love serving in this body because of its potential to do uh, to make a difference in, in people's lives. But it's not those 26 years that I have spent, but rather it is growing up in an Italian Catholic household. And as I said to you, um, that 
you know, my, my folks served on this, in the city council, um, but they didn't write, uh, you know, uh, major pieces of less legislation. For them, elected office was about using government to create opportunity, helping folks from the neighborhood if their sons or daughters got into trouble or were arrested because everyone deserved a second chance, helping, them kids, helping their kids get a first job for the city or public works. Neighbors came to our house to discuss all manner of problems. My mother, Louisa, served coffee. She baked cream puffs. Our kitchen table was my parents' office, and no one gave a second thought to dropping by day or night. Um, this is a recent for me. My mom uh, passed away five weeks ago at 103 years old. Lived an amazingly rich and full life, and to put a fine point, on what I've just said. The young man who was the uh, funeral director, um, he came to me and he said, you don't know this. He said, but your mom got me my first job uh, with the CEDAR program. You're all too young to mention, remember the CEDAR program. You remember it, Bob. Comprehensive Employment Training Act, which said that at the federal level, we should try to provide jobs for kids, particularly during the summer. He said, she got me my first job, I'll never forget it. At that same funeral service was a gentleman who headed up the Comprehensive Employment Training Agency. And he said to me, you will never know how many times your mother called my office. She made me crazy. She banged on my door, she called my house, but it was all about getting the kids in the neighborhood jobs uh, so they could uh, help to take care of their families. I also might add that in 1933, I found when I first ran for the Congress, uh, my mom was 20 years old, this was just about 13 years after women won the right to vote, and she wrote in the 10th Ward Democratic Newsletter, my motive is to encourage the female members of this organization to take a more active part in its affairs. We are not in the Middle Ages when a woman's part in life was merely to serve her master in her home, and she should enter the heretofore stronghold of the male sex politics. Come on, girls, let's make ourselves heard. 1933, I wonder where that came from uh, at, that, uh, at, at that time, but those words always ring in my head. Come on, girls, let's make our voices heard. She taught me two other things, which was to never give up and never take no for an answer. So that's the direction that I approach my job in the House of Representatives and have uh, for the last 26 years. What is the safety net? Making sure that people get a break, particularly in times of need, in difficult times. It is an array of government programs that help and protect uh, working families. Um, and it is also about making sure that kids who may grow up in poverty, they should not have to suffer and not have any dreams or aspirations for their own future. That's technically what it is. And what I've said a few moments ago was that morally, Morally, it is about that accountability to one another and to help make a difference. What is it? Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, food stamps, nutrition programs, unemployment insurance, refundable tax credits, minimum wage, and it is my hope that health care will become a firm part of that social safety net soon. And let me just tell you about, and as I said to you, because this is so critically important to understand that even in divided government, in divided government, Democrats and Republicans came together to look at some of these problems and they crafted this legislation. These laws were written not by naive people. Uh, our social safety net programs acknowledged that progress was making us on the whole richer, more powerful, but that it also led to incredible uncertainty and volatility. The designers of our social and human safety net realized that safeguards against family financial calamity benefited both the unfortunate and those in better circumstances by preserving broad-based stability and confidence in our future. These were people who understood why they were elected to Congress. That it was not about what was happening amongst all of us and in the chamber, in the House, or in the Senate, but it was about people outside of those chambers that we were concerned about or they felt concerned about and knew that they had to do something. Unlike, quite frankly, a number of the people who have come to serve 
in more recent times whose goal is in fact to try to dismantle the institution and to try to bring it down in some way. The book lays out the battles that I have fought, some won and some lost, to be able to strengthen, to expand that social safety net. 1995, Newt Gingrich, contract with America. Let's eliminate the school lunch program, let's block grant food stamps, and on the floor of the House, he said, let's let Medicare wither on the vine and let's turn it into a voucher program. Um, I went into action with others. We didn't, and uh, it just wasn't going to be. We worked uh, with the school systems, uh, public and private, all over the country. 20 to 30,000 paper plates went into members' individual offices saying to them, don't end the school lunch uh, program. Uh, which we have not done. We were there day and night on the floor of the house with regard uh, to Medicare. Uh, I went to save the children and bought their scarves and their ties, sold them to my colleagues. So every time we were on the floor of the house, uh, we were demonstrating that in a land of bounty, with an overabundance of food, we were about to deny children in this country uh, food for a school lunch program. It was pivotal in helping us to turn the issue around. Uh, they, the contract with America did not succeed. Today we have a school lunch program. Today uh, we have not yet, though they're still trying to block grant a uh, food stamp program and Medicare is the, uh, one of the single strongest bulwarks we have against um, uh, uh, for health care for older Americans. My point of this, which I should have said earlier, is that I have been there for these fights. These fights can be won, but you have to mobilize, you have to organize, you have to be and not be afraid to speak up. I take a chapter from the book of Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman who served in the House of Representatives when the press asked her, how do you implement ideas? And she said, you do not stand on the sidelines. You don't complain, you don't whimper, you just move forward and where you want to go. I would just add to that, though she said it very well, just damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Uh, and we can win these fights. And it's important to know that now, these days, about what we're able to do. In the chapter on defense of the hungry, the fight was to preserve, to protect food stamps, nutrition programs, expand the participation, raise benefits. Um, and, and we did that. I want to tell you, Democrats, Republicans, George McGovern, Bob Dole, Ted Kennedy, Jake Javits, others, Democrats, Republicans in the commission that went across the country that said there's a hunger problem in the United States. Kids in our country are going hungry. We have to do something about it. They came back to Washington and they began to initiate. It was the genesis of the first hunger programs, anti-hunger programs, and the nutrition programs in this country. In 1996, I might add, under a Democratic president, Bill Clinton, who I worked very hard for, as well as did Bob Shrum, in passage of the welfare bill, the benefits for the food stamp program were frozen in 1996. There was no pegging to inflation. The asset levels were narrowed a, a, a pretty restrictively so that you could have very little in, in asset levels in order to qualify. Uh, uh, for the program. I uh, was chair of the Agriculture Subcommittee at the time, and the then Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, uh, asked me to participate in the, uh, the conference committee between the House and the Senate on the 2008 Farm Bill. And she said, Rosa speaks for us on nutrition. Uh, our chairman, Colin Peterson of Minnesota, Colin and I don't often agree on things, but he said, Rosa speaks for us on nutrition. I'll get to the point, which was that long and the short of it, there were days I was in the opulence of United States Senate offices. You've been there, Bob, with a lot of beautiful chandeliers and gold, etc. Democrats and Republicans, and talking about uh, the food stamp program and changing the asset levels, changing the benefit levels. And it was a Democrat who shall be nameless said to me, well, my God, if we change the asset levels, these folks can go out and get a 401k. A 401k for a food stamp beneficiary. We're talking about people making 
8000 10000 $12,000 a year. And no understanding of what's happening in the lives of some people. I left that meeting and took that tram from the Senate back to my office with two staff people. And I'm not ashamed to say, I started to cry. I said, my God, I'm not sure we can get there, that we can win this. Well, I'll get you to the end of the story. Because they also, on the floor of the House, they had an amendment that cut the food stamp program by $20 billion. I was the only member of the Connecticut delegation to vote against the welfare bill. What happened in that 2008 Farm Bill? We pegged the food stamp program to inflation. We increased the benefit level. And we increased the assets that people could hold and still be eligible. And millions of more people were eligible for a food stamp program. My point is not self-serving. My point is when you stand and you fight, you can win these battles. If you think that hunger is still not a problem in the United States, let me call your attention to the state of Connecticut, statistically the richest state in the nation because of Fairfield County. In my district, 25 towns, one out of seven do not know where their next meal is coming from. A woman from Hamlin, Connecticut, has five children, three daughters, two sons, and says to me, Rosa, some weeks I feed my daughters more than my sons. They can never bring home anyone for dinner. The money just isn't there. The food stamp program is the most important anti-hunger program we have at the federal level. And the recently passed House budget about a week ago will cut the food stamp program by $150 billion. Think about it. We need to stand up, fight, and win. The chapter on the child tax credit is about the child tax credits, income supports for families, for low income, middle income uh, families. This was not about obstacles or obstruction. This was more about indifference, indifference to the plight of children and indifference to particularly poor children. I have been a strong supporter of the child tax credit. The story is all laid out there to the point of uh, when uh, Speaker Pelosi would just see me, she would put her hand up and just say, I know, I know, the child tax credit. Fighting for it today on the Ways and Means Committee. I don't sit on the Ways and Means Committee. I'm an appropriator, so I just go to Richie Neal, I go to Sandy Levin, and I go to others and say, child tax credit. If there is to be any tax bill, I am not sure there will be a tax bill this year, but the child tax credit has to be front and center. Just about a year ago, after 16 years of fighting, for it, we made the child tax credit permanent. Uh, we didn't peg it to in inflation, which is the next step that we need to move in today. Right now, in today's papers, I think in the Times, you'll see an article that says that any tax package that the child tax credit needs to be at its center. Marco Rubio in the Senate, Mike Lee from Utah in the Senate have a child tax credit uh, uh, effort when you Fight, stand up for these efforts. This is now the child tax credit and expanding it for low income families to include younger age children or six and under, those who are the most vulnerable, that this is the center of public discourse on what will be a tax cut package uh, that the Congress is taking, is taking up. A final example is equal pay for equal work. Simple concept, in my view. I introduced the legislation in 1997. We were in a desert for 12 years. Uh, couldn't get it to move or to, uh, you couldn't get any action on the, uh, the child tax, uh, on the uh, Paycheck Fairness Act. Uh, but when we did win the House back, my dear friend from California, George Miller, uh, became the chair of the Education and Labor Force. A committee and uh, I, in a Democratic leadership meeting, I went to George and I just said, let's go. Let's get the bill through the committee. We can now do it. We're in the majority. This is our moment. We can, if you can get it through the committee and on the floor, we can pass this piece of legislation and for the first time say that men and women in the same job deserve the same pay. That is the concept of the Paycheck Fairness Act. 
George Miller, who was a dear friend, reacted in such a way that I really, I, I stood back. He started to yell at me, telling me I didn't have the votes. Was I expecting him to do the work for me? What was wrong with me? You know, I, I didn't I know what was going on, how you work the process, and so forth. I said, whoa, you know, what did I do? George got up on the wrong side of the bed today. Long and the short of another dear friend of mine, longtime friend in that meeting, was Rahm Emanuel, the now current mayor of Chicago. And he looked George in the eye and he said, don't get the bitch mad. Uh, in <laughs> fact, she did get mad. I went out, I got the, more than I needed to deal with co-sponsors. Um, and one afternoon, both uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi and George Miller uh, uh, put me between the two of them and said, we're not going to be able to pass this bill because you have no cap on damages. He said, we'll never be able to get that through. It was a Friday afternoon. I said to him, give me the weekend. Let me just poll the Democratic caucus and see if we can get there. I started on the train going back to New Haven, calling every single member of the Democratic caucus, asking them how they felt about no cap on damages if women wanted to sue and they won. And, it was, um, and I found that that was not the problem, but what was a problem was the fear that what would happen with small businesses. Long and the short of it, we corrected it, we had amendments to it that would accommodate small businesses so that they would not be put in jeopardy. George took it to the committee, took it to the floor of the House. We won twice with Democrats and Republicans on the floor of the House of Representatives. We lost it in the Senate, two votes, two votes in the Senate, two women, Olympia Snow and Susan Collins. Otherwise, the bill today would be the law of the land in terms of equal pay for equal work. We won that in the House with Democrats and Republicans. I didn't mention this in the child tax credit, but Bush was for a child tax credit, Hatch was for it, Rockefeller. If you go down the line, Democrats, Republicans working together to move toward the problem. I'm going to just read to you from the last chapter and then I'm going to hush up before my friends here get annoyed at me. Um, <laughs> Anyway, give me a second here. I devote a chapter to um, Paul Ryan and say about Paul Ryan. Ryan's thinking about poverty. If you can only make receiving government aid onerous enough and humiliating enough, then people will opt out voluntarily and redouble their efforts to avoid hunger, illness, or being laid off. That idea is a slap in the face to the millions who do everything right and still cannot get by. It is a betrayal of a legacy of good government in the United States. This legacy is what I have worked to defend for 26 years. It is a vision for America that I want to expand so that all Americans can support one another in difficult times and share in prosperity. This is about the least among us waging the battle for the vulnerable. Thank you very, very much for listening. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Bob. So we have about uh, close to half an hour. I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and I'm going to turn this over to the audience. Uh, when you were talking, I thought of the fact, and I'm sure the students here aren't aware of this, that uh, student loans began uh, in this country uh, because a young senator named John F. Kennedy introduced something called the National Defense Education Act. I called it defense because that made it easier to pass. It got through and it was signed into law by a Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, you had a lot of examples of Democrats and Republicans working together. Do you see any places where the Democrats and Donald Trump can actually get together and do something? Any prospect of that? Well, let me, uh, let me just say, you can hear me without this, can't you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, wait, you said for the... Oh, I'm sorry, thank you, okay. Uh, uh, I, I'm gonna just amend that if I can, Bob. Do I think that Democrats and Republicans can come together to do things. I just will witness what um, Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray have done with regard to the Affordable Care Act. It's a two-year bridge. 
Now, the president first said he was supportive of it, but today's news said that he is not. I am not sure that we can get anything done with the, uh, with the current the president. Um, I, I don't think that he understands that we're in a legislative body and we do deal with the art of compromise. And that you, you don't give it all up, but you try to, to, to move in a direction uh, which uh, uh, furthers what the goal is. Uh, and I think there are members of the House and the Senate who understand being able to do that. I'm not sure that the President uh, understands that. So, uh, so I guess the answer is that it may be that we can't get anywhere. You, again, witness the Affordable Care Act. That's why I said I am unclear as to what could happen uh, with the tax cut uh, proposal uh, that they have. Uh, but members can work together. Members can and have worked together in the past. But not much hope with Trump. Not much hope with the president. So, uh, what do you think? I, it depends on what day of the week and what hour of the day. I mean, you know, he makes a deal with, as he calls it, Chuck and Nancy uh, on DACA and the Dreamers, and then he takes it back. He says that this uh, compromise that was worked out on the Affordable Care Act that would restore the subsidies so low-income people could afford insurance, that he's all for it. And then he goes to the Heritage Foundation and said he's all against it. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe you just have to find the exact right moment. Mm -hmm. But what, what strikes me is how much, if we were sitting here a year ago, how improbable it seemed that we would be saying President Donald Trump. Absolutely. Right. Why do you think we lost, or Democrats lost right. that election? Let me just make one point about what you're saying, and that has much to do with it. In, 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 in the institution, the only credibility you have is your and Republicans, and you make a commitment to do something, they do, and you move forward. And that's happened with it's Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander, there are other issues, of Chuck and Nancy, etc. But we are on, on, on such uncertain ground because you're right, he continues to pull the rug out from under everything. That's both domestically and inter uh, and, uh, and, 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 and internationally. Um, that's helping. What was the last question? Why, how did Democrats ah, okay, lose the unlosable Yeah, I will tell you that, um, yeah, I, I, I was, uh, I wrote, I was in the process of writing this book. I never thought that uh, it was going to be such a, an assault on the social safety net. I thought Hillary Clinton was going to get elected and uh, that I was going to impose on her to make the uh, Paycheck Fairness, Equal Pay for Equal Work, the first bill that she signed the way that President Clinton did um, uh, family medical leave and President Obama did with the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Anyway, why? I believe that uh, there are two or three things. One, I don't believe we had an economic message to deliver uh, to, uh, to the country, to people who were um, feeling so economically insecure. Today, the biggest challenge that we have are people in jobs that do not pay them enough money. They are struggling. And you know, you can say, you go out with people on the weekend, all of you gather together, and somebody will say, why, why? How can the people in the middle of this country be uh, so stupid? They're not stupid. They are in very dire economic uh, circumstances. And we didn't understand, we didn't understand that. We were not listening to that. We were tone deaf. Some were tone deaf to that. Uh, uh, to that set of circumstances. Uh, so that we, uh, in the last few weeks, we, we did focus on that until we really got, uh, in the debates, um, uh, Secretary Clinton did, did very well. We were about at parity uh, with Donald Trump on the economic message, but from that point on, uh, we, um, uh, we just said we were gonna move to um, love Trump's hate and a whole variety of other messages that did not resonate with people. And I'll just say for the Democratic Party, my view is that what the Democratic Party, if we do not re reconnect with working Americans, 
um, that we're uh, not gonna be able uh, to, to win it back. Do I think we can? I am not Pollyanna, but I am optimistic about our opportunity to do that. We have to really walk in people's shoes, understand the depth of their difficulties in the guys' economy. They tell their very bright kids, like all of you are bright, I'm sorry, we can't send you to school. Did anybody read the New York Times on Sunday about the story about the steel worker mm -hmm. whose daughter got accepted to Purdue? And they waited on the edge of their seats on that graduation night to see if she had been able to win any scholarships because if she didn't, she was not going to be able to pursue an education. That is happening over and over and over again in this country. And Democrats have got to understand it. Uh, I don't think our standard bearer understood that in the last election. That was pretty honest. Uh, some, in fact, it's very honest. Some, some folks say that to, to get a handle on an economic message that resonates with these displaced, stressed, especially white blue collar workers, that to do that, the Democratic Party has to de-emphasize social justice issues. Do you think you have to choose one or the no, other? No, I, I, I just think that is, if, 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 I, I can't do the exact quote, but this is what Steve Bannon said, that let's get uh, the Democrats to continue to focus on identity politics. We focus on the economy and we crush them. That is a false construct. Uh, and we should not buy into it by any stretch of the imagination. The, you know, the, the, the problem in these areas is their families, the social fabric is disintegrating. It's not just the loss of a job uh, or, or decrease in wages. They are they're, they're divorces, kids on opioids, it is a both, both an economic and a, uh, a cultural uh, disintegration that they're experiencing. And I believe if we can talk about, I'll give you an example. Six, not, Seventy percent of the people in this country do not have a college degree. So what, what, what do we do? We say we're only going to deal with four-year liberal arts college and that's it. The rest of you, you know, sorry. No, what should we be doing? And we can deal with that. What are we doing about the, the partnership between community colleges and colleges and businesses to create apprenticeship and internships at the end of which it's a job and, and a certificate that says you don't have to go for four years if that's not what you want to do. And so we have to find the ways of addressing the, the uh, economic issue and defend the social justice issues as well. The problem with those folks who are in trouble is that they believe and they have been persuaded by people in very high places in this country that you are responsible for my not having a job. You've gotten one at my expense. And that's not the road that we should go down. I think I'd love to turn this over to the audience will let you folks ask questions. Uh, anybody with a question? I have more if you don't. Yeah, up there. You mentioned... Uh, someone will bring a mic over to you. I don't want to answer question. You mentioned the, the false dichotomy between uh, separation of social justice issues and the economic message. But in terms of managing perception, not only for your constituency, but for the total constituency, how do you make it so that you appear to be doing both at the same time without really without really confirming the, I guess, thoughts of the opposing party that, oh, they're just going back to the social issues because that's what they're good at, because that's what's easy to defend? Look, I, I'll give you the example of my, my district, okay? I'll use, use, use myself. First of all, I'll give you the state of Connecticut. Hillary Clinton won the state of Connecticut by 52%. Blue state, 52%. Uh, the 25 towns that I represent, I win usually all 25. I won 24, 25, and Jimmy is my campaign manager. Is here. He's going to find those folks who didn't vote for me in that, in that town. But my, uh, Donald Trump won 15 of the towns in my district. The folks in my, I've been there 26 years. I haven't bobbed or weaved on what I talk about 
I go out and talk about immigration. I'm the daughter of an immigrant family. I told you that at the outset. I defend the city of New Haven as a sanctuary city. I've been to the churches where our uh, folks have, are hiding themselves because of fear of deportation. I stood tall in front of the, uh, just about three weeks ago, at the New Haven Police Department with our two senators and talked about guns. Uh, I had strong blue collar folks in my district. On the other hand, they know where I stand on jobs and wages. And if we don't start to deal, and any, uh, any discussion of income inequality starts with wages, which is where we have to go and the kinds of work that we have to do to turn it around. And I dealt with legislation in this area, with apprenticeships, with infrastructure, etc. They know where I'm coming from. Uh, and I don't mince my words as to who I stand for and what I stand for. Uh, and it's understanding those folks who have not been given a chance and those folks who have lost what chance they have and they know that I'm there for them on that. That's what allows me to win to come back every two years. Let me add one thing to that, because uh, what popped into my head when you were talking about that, uh, uh, JFK and LBJ in the 1960s, uh, stood up very much on what was then the predominant social issue of the day, civil rights, uh, and introduced a civil rights bill in the same year that Kennedy did that and called it a moral issue, the first time a president ever did it. He also presented a tax cut bill, not the kind we're seeing now, a different kind of tax cut bill, but one that gave a tax cut to a lot of Americans to get the economy moving again. And people understood that you could be both for social justice and for economic justice at the same time. And in fact, in a certain way, they go together. In a certain way, if you don't have one, you're never really gonna have the other. Another question? Hi there, thank you very much for coming. I'm just interested in what you think the uh, biggest issue for the average poor family in America is. So say we theoretically don't have any cuts to any of the programs, what are the things that we need to expand upon? Is it food insecurity? Is it rent cost, health care, et cetera, et cetera? Well, you know, I, I, I think at the, at the center of it is, as I said, the economic <coughs> challenge is, is wages. People are in jobs that are not paying them enough to live on. And so if, if you start there, what are the ways in which we can help to address um, uh, uh, this effort? Uh, first of all, with some of the things that are already uh, uh, part of a social safety net. One is the increase in minimum wage. Uh, the other is when someone is unemployed, um, the ex expansion of unemployment uh, benefits. Uh, and quite frankly, that was supported by Democratic presidents and Republican presidents and Congresses in the past, just several years ago. Um, the view was that if you provided unemployment benefits, then people would not go and look for jobs so that it was cut off, which is, or these folks would, became roadkill, quite frankly. Uh, take a look at the child tax credits. I'm, I'm thinking about what ways in which a family, as you've laid out, can gain some economic advantage. The child tax credit, the earned income tax credit. And if we look um, to, uh, to the child tax credit, who are the families that are most in need, the most vulnerable? Uh, they are families with young children, six years and under. Let's make that child tax, credible, ta tax credit refundable so if their uh, income doesn't uh, meet their tax obligation, um, they are able then to get the rest of that, of that money. My bill talks about $3,600. Uh, to that, to the family, and you, there, there would be no uh, uh, earnings uh, uh, threshold like there is today, uh, and we would phase the money in at an earlier rate. But as I said, it's also being talked about on the Republican side as well, which is which is a good thing. There are some things I would add to that: paid family and medical leave for families today. People get sick. Their kids get sick. Their parents get sick. And today, if that happens, 
you can't get paid for the time off. I was with my mother for seven weeks. Now the Congress was not in session during that time. My mother was very thoughtful. <laughs> However, if we had been in session, I would have been with my mother that time. Now, I would have gotten paid. That's not the case for most families in this country. You can't take off, um, you know, a, a length of time. This bill, my bill would, on, on this issue would go, and Senator Gillibrand and I have uh, this bill um, uh, that we proposed, that you would get up to 12 weeks of paid family leave at about, you know, two thirds of your salary, and it is a contribution from employer and employee. We don't have something nationally on paid sick days, so that almost 50% of the folks who work in private companies today do not have one paid sick day. So if your kid gets sick, you can't stay home, maybe, because you won't get paid, or if you had to do several days, you could potentially lose your job. That helps families. Cost of child care, Connecticut, for one child, fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars a year for child care. So, people have a ragged system that they call aunts, uncles, friends, etc., to take care of their kids. But that's about people being able to go to work. If you have someone with your child and a system there. So, what, what about universal child care? Okay. So, all of those pieces, they're connected. So, you have to take a look at what are parts of the social safety net already, and what are the areas in which we are going to uh, add on. And the big one is, and I won't go on any further, it's affordable health care, which is what the affordable health care bill was all about. Another question? Hi, um, so it seems like a lot of the policies you've been talking about um, a lot of the policies you've been talking about, Hillary Clinton also ran on um, in 2016, um, but you did mention that she didn't win a lot of the towns in your district. So I was just wondering how you maybe better articulated uh, your economic message to your constituents than she did. Well, I, 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 my, my sense was that it, it, it didn't come across uh, from Secretary Clinton that uh, she had a lot of plans. I, I, re really, she did, and really the, the debate, she wasn't the, the, the debate, she talked about, you know, uh, uh, we had to have an economy that worked for all, and people listened to her. But as we went into the election, none of that was articulated in a way that had people believing that, that, that's what she was for. Trump spoke always about the economy, what do you have to lose, the forgotten people, uh, et cetera. That wasn't part of the, um, of the narrative uh, for the secretary. In addition to that, coupled with that, to be very honest with you, not just say it, and I, again, I worked very, very hard for Hillary. I worked very hard for Barack Obama. I was one of the first people to come out for Barack Obama, and at that time, I was pilloried by most of the women's groups in Washington because I didn't come out for Hillary the first time, first time around. But Barack Obama's message at the end, and it was Hillary's message was, we were going to continue the four years. We were going to build on the four years. It wasn't any departure from what people were feeling and where they were in their own lives. And they said, the hell, I'm gonna take a chance. I, I speak very clearly about where I think we need to go and that it should be an economy that's not rigged for the middle class, uh, for low income people, that we have to have corporations uh, who have, are not paying their fair share of taxes, the wealth that is gone to the people at the top 1%, the top one-tenth of 1%, and, and there has been no trickle down at all, uh, and that we need to level that playing field. And I, I speak 
very, very plainly uh, about that, like I'm speaking to you uh, today, to my constituents. So. Uh, by the way, uh, in her book, uh, Hillary Clinton says that she did talk about the economy and complains that she wasn't covered. But, you know, in campaigns, what matters is what you have control over. And you have control over your message and the way to deliver it. The most telling statistic is that only 9% of the Clinton ads ever mention jobs or the economy, and often in the context of renewable energy, which is hardly the way to connect with these folks. Uh, so I think that was a big part of the problem. Uh, another question? Thank you so much for coming. Um, what advice do you have for women who want to run for office, and what do you think um, people who don't run for office can do to solve these problems? Well, let me take the, the, the first one first. The first one first. Jump off the cliff. Take a chance. You know, I ran for office the first time, not ever having run for office for any position before. I had great jobs. I managed campaigns. I managed Senator Dodd's campaign, served as his, his chief of staff. And when the opportunity arose, I was conflicted. I, I said, oh, you know, I loved what I was doing. Uh, I had a great job. Uh, and, uh, it, 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 you know, but if the opportunity ar arises, that you need to take that chance uh, uh, to do it. For me, it was a very steep learning curve. I'd run campaigns. I was, you know, uh, uh, so in terms of the, the, you know, the portfolio of issues. And for women, women, excuse me, gentlemen, always take these issues more seriously. You think you're not prepared enough for taking these jobs on, and you are. Uh, but that is still, as women have to work harder, even today in the House of Representatives, it's still, that's still a, a fact. But you know, people ask me today, are you, uh, has the job met your expectations? This job has exceeded my expectations. I was afraid when I got to the Congress, I was at a table where there were orientation, and a wonderful, wonderful colleague who has uh, since retired, David Obi of Wisconsin. Brilliant. Um, I was listening to him talk about the budget and the appropriations process, and I just said, excuse me, holy shit, I'm in over my head. What did I get myself into? How will I ever speak to this individual? Well, not only did I speak to him, he became my biggest friend, and, the, and one of the most important influences on me in the House of Representatives. But you gotta take the chance. You gotta be willing to do that. You gotta be willing not to be with your family every night for dinner, because you can't be. But it is so worth it to take it on. And what it can do for people who don't get it, are, are not gonna run for office. And by the way, since the election, women have come out of the woodwork to run for office. Women's Campaign Fund, Emily's List. I was the executive director of Emily's List at one part in my career to help uh, women run and win for, for, uh, for, uh, for, for office. Uh, but women are running all over the country and outstanding candidates is what, what we need. But for those who don't, take, take quickly. A year ago, would you have believed that the Congress, either the House or the Senate, would have been able to rebut a replace and repeal piece of legislation. I wouldn't. I was scared of what they would do. But in the House of Representatives, Paul Ryan took his trip to the White House and he said, I have to pull the bill. I don't have the votes. Democrats, and all the Democrats, 34 Republicans said no. We are not going to support this repeal and replace bill. In the Senate, twice, they said no. It wasn't because of members of the House or the Senate. Who did it? You did it if you were engaged and involved. The people of this country stood up. They called, they wrote, they marched, they went to members' offices, they protested, and they said no. You will not repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. It needs serious changes, but for the first time, <coughs> I have health insurance, my family has health insurance, I have a pre-existing condition, and this is the only thing that is going to save my life. 
So when the rhetoric, it went from rhetoric to reality. People stood up and said, no, we have to do that on the tax cut proposal that's coming up. And one thing that no one mentioned, quite honestly, I wish we would have a program on this, is the budget which has passed the House, and I believe today was going to pass in the Senate, which is cruel and it is inhumane. And we need a hard look at that, as the public does, to stand up and say no. That your job as a member of the House or the Senate is in jeopardy if you vote for this. Uh, by the way, if, uh, if that budget goes into effect, none of you will ever get Medicare. You'll get a voucher. It's $150 billion. No, it's $1.5 trillion in cuts to Medicare and Medicaid. $90 billion in terms of social services and education. If you're here on a Pell Grant, they're going to move that number and they're going to move it down. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think we all understand why Rosa Delora wins all 25 towns in her district. Uh, I want to thank her for coming. I want to thank her personally. I want to thank her on behalf of the Institute of Politics here. Uh, thank you very, very much. This thank was you. terrific. And her book is on the table over there.